Hi, folks. Uh, I'm hoping we'll have a few others show up, uh, but I just I want to get us started out of respect for your time and our guest time. Juan Alvarado, Senior Director of Energy Analysis with the American Gas Association. Juan, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, talking about the uh, recent American Gas Foundation study, Enhancing and Maintaining Gas and Energy System Resiliency. As I think uh, all of you on this webinar are aware, um, resiliency is an important uh, part of what the gas system, 2.5 million miles or so across uh, the U.S., three probably more like 3.5 million across North America and, and about 130,000 miles of infrastructure here in our footprint, resiliency is a big part of what, uh, what that gas system contributes to the overall energy system. So this is an important study and we're really grateful, Juan, that you're able to come and join us and, and share a bit about this study. Just a reminder to our, our webinar participants here, remember uh, to keep yourself muted. If you're not muted, please do so. Um, we'll, we'll mute everybody. Uh, use the chat function to pose your questions and I will be monitoring that all day long. Uh, so if you have questions, raise them. And uh, Juan, if I see a question in the chat, I'll interrupt you at an opportune moment and ask the question. And then I believe, uh, Juan, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're able to make this presentation available after the webinar, the slide deck. You'll contact Judy, uh, who sent you your invitation to the webinar this morning and ask her for the slide deck if you're interested. We will also post a recording of this webinar to our YouTube channel, which will be available probably later today, but certainly by, uh, by tomorrow morning. Uh, before I turn the, the day is over, well, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and, and get started with Juan. I just wanna, wanna point out here, uh, we, our next webinar is January 20th. That's a special day, that's Friday. Uh, instead of Thursday, it's at 10 a.m. instead of noon. We're doing this in conjunction with the Northwest Alliance for Clean Transportation, which is a uh, creature of the Gas Association, uh, focused on uh, deploying uh, NGVs and helping fleets analyze whether or not to adopt uh, renewable natural gas and natural gas uh, motive technologies. So we'll have that webinar is with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality and Washington State Department of Ecology on their respective clean fuel programs, uh, also known as low carbon fuel standards, credits that they generate and uh, where they're at in the process. Oregon DEQ has updated its clean fuels program just recently. And of course, uh, Ecology in Washington state is uh, adopting the rules, implementing its clean fuel program. So that's January 20th. Uh, we hope you'll join us January 20th at 10 a.m. So with that, Juan, I'm gonna quit sharing and allow you to share your screen and uh, ask you to take it away. All right, Dan, thank you so much. Let me try this out. I hope that worked and if it didn't, please let me know. It does work. Awesome, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Juan Alvarado, the Senior Director of Energy Analysis at AGA. And uh, my role, in my role, really, uh, I, I look at all of the analysis that the association does. Uh, and also, I uh, spend a lot of my time working on these reports that are put out by the American Gas Foundation. And for those of you who don't know, the Amer American Gas Foundation is a 501c3 organization that focuses on research. Um, as a 501c3 organization, all of our research must be published. Uh, if, if we if we complete it. So uh, the, the whole point of these reports is to put out a, a fact-based kind of look at several aspects of the gas industry. And uh, we uh, look at several different uh, topics uh, on this. Uh, and I will mention that this is the second resiliency report that the American Gas Foundation puts out. Uh, the previous one having been come out about two years ago. Um, so, so let's, let's get into it. Um, so as an agenda, I'm gonna tell you what the report was like, uh, our approach, our overview. Then we're gonna tell you what our research told us and some of the recommendations that come out of the report. Um, as part of the American Gas Foundation, these, this is the executive committee of members and, uh, and the board. 
uh, all of these people participated in the creation of this uh, study and they all gave their approval for its publication. So anyway, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, about two years ago, we uh, published a previous report. That report, uh, we went out and we issued an RFP for people who would uh, be willing to create this report uh, with us. And ultimately, Guidehouse uh, Consulting uh, Firm was chosen to create that report. And uh, since this was a follow-up on that report, Guidehouse was selected again to create the follow-up. Uh, basically, uh, there were a couple of things that are more than a couple, a number of things that we learned from that first report, right? First, that resilience is uh, a crucial component of a dependable energy system. Um, and it's really obtained by creating redundancy in your energy resources, meaning you can provide energy to different customers through several different means. Um, and then because of that, if you enhance resiliency in one system, then that by definition enhances the resiliency of the entire system. Uh, when we look at this report, we really talk about the energy system resiliency, meaning both gas and electric systems working together to create resiliency. Uh, uh, but obviously our focus is on how gas uh, serves that energy system resiliency. And then really uh, the reason why gas is so important for energy system resiliency is because uh, the gas system can be stored. Uh, it uh, is very capable of meeting seasonal and particular peak day demands. Um, you know, peak days uh, have historically been very, very seasonal, but as we'll talk about in a little, in a little while, uh, the seasonality of those peaks has started to change over time. And that's something that needs to be considered when we design the uh, energy system of the future and we look at how to enhance the resiliency of that energy fit system of the future. And then um, you know, really uh, that initial report uh, looked at some of the investments that could be made to support that resiliency. Um, now, of course, uh, for those of you in this call, most of you know that uh, our gas utilities are heavily regulated. And therefore, um, one of the questions that remains is how do we bolster those uh, investments that we are going to make? Um, and how do we collect them? And that's when we get into the whole regulatory issue around resiliency. So uh, the report as a follow-up asks, asks some, some key questions. Um, pieces of our regulatory framework really allow us to focus and uh, invest in that gas resilience. And then uh, if, if we do that, how does that uh, supplement the total energy system resilience that we have? Um, in order to be able to recover those costs for resiliency, we really need to think about how resiliency can be valued and measured. Obviously, if we're recovering costs based on the benefits that it provides to customers, then we need to be able to quantify and measure those benefits. Now, that is a question that is not fully answered in this report, not because of lack of trying, but because it's actually really hard and it's probably something that we're gonna to have to look at into the future. Um, but it is a question that uh, was uh, front and center in our mind as we uh, embarked in this report. And then uh, once we recognized what the current regular framework uh, looks like, uh, and we recognize where we want to be in the future, then we make certain recommendations about how to make changes to make sure that the uh, uh, energy system remains resilient going into the future. Now, um, uh, my colleagues at uh, Guidehouse have spent a ton of time really looking into the difference between resiliency and reliability, and they almost contractually forced me to put this slide uh, on my deck because um, you know, as we walk through this, you'll notice that uh, a lot of the people that we interviewed, and there are interviews in this report, a lot of people that we interviewed in this report really recognized that there is a massive difference between resiliency and reliability, but that that is not necessarily recognized by the wider energy system community, particularly those in, uh, in the regulatory world. Uh, really, what we're talking about when we talk about resiliency is our ability to uh, prepare uh, withstand and recover from high impact, low probability events. Whereas reliability, we're talking about how to prepare, withstand and recover from 
high probability but low impact events. So when we talk about reliability, we talk about how our energy system performs during something as simple as a heavy rain. When we talk about resiliency, we talk about how our system performs during those major, major events that sometimes uh, we have to, to live through. So anyway, that's the slide. God has, should be happy now, but I think it's an important slide. Um, so uh, as we looked at resiliency, we realized that, uh, you know, really natural gas infrastructure is critical to supporting gas powered electric generation systems. And again, this is a, a conclusion that comes from our, in, uh, our first report. Um, and because uh, gas, uh, you know, gas um, resiliency, uh, that report showed that it can't be looked at in a bubble, that it does serve to also support energy system resiliency, then um, we need to start looking at resiliency in a different way, right? Particularly from a regulatory perspective and a cost recovery perspective. Um, one of the main reasons why that is so is because of our ability to store uh, the natural gas and have it available, it's dispatchable and ready to be used whenever we need it the most. We don't have to use it all as it's being generated from an electric perspective. We can store it and then use it for generation and then we can store it and use it uh, for all kinds of end use processes during um, the peak days. So when it's particularly cold and people are really turning on their furnaces. Um, the last piece that our previous report really focused on is how low carbon fuses can be integrated, fuels can be integrated into um, that natural gas system and then can be used in the energy system uh, going forward into the future to really bolster that reliability even um, in, in a future energy system where sustainability is as crucial as we've come to expect, right? So anyway, here's some additional research impacts, uh, uh, sorry, research insights uh, of how all of these things impact the energy system. Really, at the end of the day, we realize that uh, there needs to be more coordination between the gas and the electric systems. Uh, simply because of this big connection through resiliency. And then uh, that uh, simply uh, stems from the fact that natural gas accounts for about one third of the primary energy consumption across all sectors of the economy. Um, and increasingly so, it's become more and more used for energy generation. Uh, now, we've always used uh, natural gas for generation, but and, and we all have heard the story of how we started to move away from coal and to use natural gas for those sorts of for, for electric generation. But this last summer, uh, for the first time in history, uh, on a couple of days, the U.S. used up, upwards of 50 BCF of natural gas for energy generation. That was an all-time record. And so, as, as we see more of this, uh, we start noticing how you know maybe in some areas of the country. Um, the traditional view that natural gas really serves the winter peak is no longer the reality. And then, you know, we, we've seen that for a couple of decades now, and particularly for you guys in the Northwest, that might be true, right? That really we're using it for uh, electric generation uh, during the hottest days of the year. And so, um, and so that all needs to be taken into account when we look at energy system resiliency. Now, let me uh, start here with this map. This is the map of the billion dollar weather and climate disasters from 2021. As you can see, there's a lot. There are hurricanes and tornadoes and big massive storms and fires, particularly in the West, uh, floods. All of these events cost a um, billion dollar, cost billions of dollars when all was said and done, right? Uh, we've seen that uh, more importantly, the want, number. Yes, Dan. Sorry, I have a, a good question in the chat. Does the one third uh, energy include transportation? I think yeah. you're a couple slides back. So, uh, yeah. So you're you're talking here where it says natural accounts for one third of primary energy consumption. Right. right. Does that include transportation? So that is total and for all principal sectors of the economy, including transportation. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for um, the person who submitted that question. That I was a little tardy getting to it. <laughs> no. Problem. Um, so we were talking about the number of billion dollar uh, climate events in the United States in 2021. 
uh, more importantly, look at the growth rate uh, in these billion dollar uh, events, right? They have been growing over time. And as climate events happen, more and more, the energy system is being forced to withstand these resiliency events. And the natural gas system has been called upon more and more to help the U.S. withstand that. And obviously, we've had some very major uh, examples of this going on. Like, for example, Winter Storm Uri uh, was a, a major example of, um, of, of a situation where uh, the, the resiliency of the energy system was put to, to the test. And if you look back to what happened during uh, Winter Storm Uri, you'll see that, uh, you know, even at the worst of times, the natural gas system was really carrying most of the load uh, in terms of energy uh, at the peak of peaks, right? Those peaks that were beyond design date conditions. So, yep, it's been growing and it'll continue to grow uh, if, if, if things continue to, to move in the direction that we've seen them move in the, in the recent past. Um, now, uh, when we look at things like Winter Storm Uri, we really see how um, the electric system and the gas system were, system were not really coordinated in many ways. Uh, the electric system just thought that the natural gas would be available to for their use whenever they needed and as much gas as necessary. And it turns out that, you know, gas is there and it's stored, but it can't be tele teleported from one place to the other. And we saw Governor Abbott, for example, close the LNG export facilities to no to no benefit because at the end of the day you couldn't use that gas and throw it back into uh quickly move it towards a peaker plant so um you know because of that requirement that we plan right um we really need to uh start coordinating ahead of time to make sure that all that the natural gas is available for all end uses it's, it should be available for generation during the peak of peaks. It should also be available to our customers during the peak of peaks who are trying to keep warm, who are trying to, um, you know, heat some some a, a hot beverage or um, or uh, or cook some some food in their stove. So uh, so that that is important, and because we also recognize that natural gas, you know, it, it the pipelines are all buried and all these things. Um, that natural gas is inherently more resilient than the electric transmission and distribution systems, then we need to continue to focus on that um, uh, on that coordinated and uh, coordination and that uh, resiliency as a whole. Dan, do you have a question? Well, yeah, Juan, I just wanted to pop in here. I have a question, and that is, how? how so the way I'm interpreting this slide and, and what you're suggesting here, particularly your actually both the two bullets on the side is that the end use of gas is inherently a resilient energy resource. And so the fact that in our neck of the woods, 45% of or more actually, um, depending on the state, but in our footprint, 45% of end use energy, excluding transportation, 45% of end use energy is provided by natural gas. And that's inherently resilient. So that all by itself creates some resiliency uh, components to the broader system, right? I'm trying to think about how do I communicate this to my next door neighbor? Yes, so if you think about it as an average, right? Average resiliency of the energy system, right? Most of the resiliency during the peak of peaks really comes from the gas system, right? You get customers who are able to access that gas to be able to, you know, get energy into their homes, and then concurrently, a lot of the electric resiliency comes from natural gas as well, and so um, it, the resiliency of the energy system as a whole is wholly dependent right now on natural gas, and that's not easily replaceable, which is important to keep in mind. It's not easy to replace that because of the. Uh, characteristics of natural gas, like its dispatchability, its ability to be stored, and its ability to be generated, particularly, uh, you know, during cold, gloomy days. And so, so yes, you're absolutely right. I think what's going on here is that uh, the energy system really relies on the gas system for its resiliency during the worst of times more than ever. So let's look a little bit of, about some additional insights from our report. Um, historically, we've seen, we've talked about a distributed generation 
in the context of electricity, right? Uh, however, uh, in, in the process of, of researching this report, we started to notice a pattern, and that is uh, that distributed generation is becoming a, a big deal for the gas systems, in, particularly in certain areas of the country. So we talked about peak of peaks uh, during the winter for those areas of the country that are really cold. We talked about peak of peaks for some areas of the country that get really hot, and now they're using that natural gas for electric generation. But if you look at certain areas, like for example, Louisiana, Texas, Florida, you start noticing that their system peaks during the September through October, and October months. And of course, we all know what's going on in September, October, right? It's the height of the hurricane season. What's going on really is that customers um, who are experiencing these massive storms are now buying Generex and using those to supplement their electric generation by just running a natural gas generac from their home. And that has some very interesting and important implications that we need to take into account. Uh, for one, I think all of AGA members um, are prepared and are able to provide capacity for their system as a whole, right? But what happens when you've, uh, for example, built um, uh, a service line into a cul-de-sac, for example, a main into a cul-de-sac with several service lines that are expecting a certain level of gas usage. And then all of a sudden, every single home in that cul-de-sac decides to turn on their natural gas powered generic. Obviously the draw on the system is, is, is extremely big. And if the utility is not prepared, then um, it could have some serious implications even for that, just that tiny corner of the system. So. Some of our utilities have started to uh, look into how do we, you know, obviously they're prepared, they're, they're, they're trying to put investment into place to make sure that that doesn't happen. But at the same time, they need recovery, they need to explain this to, 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 to the utilities, and they will also have to start by figuring out who really should pay for this. And here's where we get into that avoided cost question, right? The um, electric customer is losing power, that has a tremendous cost to their to, to, to themselves, uh, and they are offsetting that cost by once again relying on the resiliency of the natural gas system to serve their energy needs. And so, if if we are doing that uh, as a natural gas utility, and we're doing that for the benefit of yes, our natural gas customers, but in some instances, also uh, customers that are heavily reliant on electric right systems then who really is benefiting from that is the electric system benefiting from our ability to provide that resiliency i think the answer is yes and part of what we're doing in this report is starting to look at how do we account for that in our rate making and our regulatory processes um so uh so yeah this is this was a, a real important insight to us is that distributed na nature of uh, the natural gas system coming into play. Now, we, I say and I talk about your natural gas generax in certain areas of the country where natural gas has been constrained. Uh, what people are doing is not necessarily moving into natural gas generax, but diesel generax. And if you talk to, for example, our friends uh, in Southern California, you start noticing that during these uh, uh, blackout events and things like that, and people are running their diesel generacs, that's when you see the highest concentration of emissions, uh, simply because there's no access to gas. And so that's another insight that I thought is really interesting from this report, and that needs to be studied further in the future. Um, so as part of this report, one of the things that we did was we went out and we talked to a number of regulators from across the country. Now, um, I can tell you that at least one, possibly more of those regulators comes from the Pacific North Northwest, from one of those states. Uh, I am not allowed uh, to either mention the uh, commissioners themselves or uh, where they come from. But uh, one of the other salient points that I got from out of this is about education. Uh, we have uh, uh, the amount of churn in the regulatory world is incredible. So we think to ourselves, okay, well, we've, we've told people about this resiliency, so we're done. The answer is no. So we interviewed most of these commissioners earlier this year, and 60% of them are no longer commissioners now. 
the churn is unbelievable. Uh, these were seasoned commissioners that wanted to talk to us, but they are now gone and we need to continue to educate uh, many of these commissioners into the future about the benefits of gas and how, what they bring in terms of resiliency to the system. When we talked to these regulators, we had, um, you know, we had a lot of, of feedback on, on, on resiliency. The first one is they said, well, you know, we understand resiliency. We've, we're, we're seasoned. We know what's going on here. But we really don't have in a lot of states the laws and the ability from a, from a political perspective to adequately support resiliency in the system. And so one of the things that they mentioned is if, for example, a legislature was to recognize the importance of resiliency and that uh, same legislature was to pass laws that allow us, for example, recovery in many ways of those investments, then uh, we would be able to, uh, to, to allow that recovery and, and really focus on resiliency. However, that's not always uh, the case, right? There's not uh, a lot of regulatory uh, initiatives that specifically gas, uh, address gas system resiliency. In fact, I didn't notice, I, I, we asked a number of commissioners and none of them could even mention one that specifically targets resiliency. What they did mention is that resiliency is often uh, embedded in other standards, particularly reliability. Um, now, uh, there's reasons for that. The first one is that reliability has been a big deal um, for many years and the electric side in terms of, you know, uh, the, these uh, utilities um, or these commissions will look at things like SADI, SAFI, KATI that are embedded to the way they are, they're building these uh, electric uh, systems. But those concepts have not really translated everywhere into the gas system. And so, um, Oftentimes what they do is they will look at a reliability standard or they will look at a reliability program and they will say, look, this might not be a resiliency, but it's close and it's the best we can do right now. So take, for example, pipeline replacement programs as a good example, right? Uh, we talked to several commissioners who said, yes, resiliency is critical. Yes, we recognize it. No, we don't have the ability to focus on resiliency, but as part of our pipeline replacement program, we included certain concepts that would certainly help towards resiliency. Now, if we could make those more explicit, we would. And so again, it goes back to the idea that uh, sometimes commissions just have their hand, hands tied and they can't really focus on, on that aspect of the system necessarily. And we need to continue to educate not only our commissions, but our legislatures to ensure that they understand why this is so important. Um, and then finally, even if they had the ability to focus on resiliency and to create programs that enhance resiliency, then the question becomes, how do we recover those costs? Um, generally, we, uh, we looked to cost causation in our cost service studies to determine where some cost will be allocated to. The problem with cost causation uh, in this instance and some others is that cost causation really goes outside the bounds of the natural gas system because we're providing such resiliency to the energy, to the electric system. And so the question becomes, how do we ensure that those who are benefiting from our res resiliency uh, efforts, how do, how do we make sure that they pay for that, for that cost, right? Um, so we looked into several mechanisms. For example, you can do so through a resiliency surcharge that is applied uh, almost like a, like, like, a, like a pool that is then drawn for them by commissions to allow for resiliency investments. We look at uh, what happens when you throw it into, um, into um, rate base and why rate base might not necessarily always be the best way to go about that simply because of those cross subsidization issues that I just mentioned. So anyway, this report starts to look into these things. Now, again, when you talk about things like cross subsidizations across industries, things like that, obviously, as you all probably know, things get really complicated. And so we only touched upon a little bit of that in this report, but we do make an effort to kind of move a little bit uh, further uh, and to kind of tease out the idea that we want to look at this in the future and we really want to focus on it. When we talk about standards again, 
not a lot of standards out there, but one of the concepts that comes to the forefront is the idea that we can use some of those reliability standards that are that already exist and can be used to improve that natural gas system resiliency. So I'm not going to go through that table, obviously, that shows all the nine key NERC standards. Uh, but this table is in the report and you can, if you're interested, you can read it and see how we could use some of those concepts from the NERC reliability standards and turn them into standards for resiliency in the natural gas system at the local level. Um, and so, uh, you know, hopefully that is a starting point for any of you who are looking to look at resiliency and to implement those resiliency uh, uh, standards in your own jurisdictions. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the recommendations that come out of this report. Uh, we split them between two things, right? Upstream and downstream of the CETA gates. Now, if, for those of you, all of you are in the natural gas industry. And so many of these things will be self-evident. What's interesting about all of this is that when you presented, so I presented this uh, before NERC, uh, and I presented it before other outside groups that are not as kind of kind of laser focused on gas. Obviously, commissioners have to regulate all kinds of industries and their attention is split over everything. They thought that these insights were actually pretty revelatory to them. And so it's important for us to keep in mind that sometimes uh, some of these uh, rec recommendations might sound uh, obvious to us, but they're not as obvious to some of the people that we have to interact with. Uh, obviously, upstream and downstream of the city, city gates, we need to be weather ready, right? We need to invest in weatherization to make sure that when the rain, the hail, the uh, the snow, the wind, all of that uh, comes our way, that uh, our system is ready, prepared to withstand those types of situations. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, aging pipeline continues to be replaced. Obviously, those interconnections, both upstream and downstream of the city gates, are um, are really um, uh, some of the, of, the, of the easiest to kind of fail during, during, um, during big events. And so we need to make sure that we continue to replace those aging pipelines to make sure that the gas is available and that we don't have any failures in our system. Um, we also need to create redundancies uh, to make sure that particularly downstream of the seated gates, if a customer, if, if we lose, um, pressure in a pipeline or something like that, and we need to shut it off, that we have the ability to serve those customers through a different means, uh, maybe different pipeline, things like that. Um, we definitely need to ensure that we can accommodate low carbon fuel, uh, uh, fuels, because obviously as we provide resiliency, we can't forget some of the other attributes that make our gas system great, including sustainability. Um, we can be sustainable while offering all of this. So we need to make sure that when we install new assets that they are available to accommodate low carbon fuels, including hydrogen, if that's the direction that we want to take our system in. Um, and then just generally, we need to modernize the infrastructure. I always say that uh, our energy system today is safe, reliable, resilient, and affordable. And that as we move into sustainable, we really don't want to lose any of those attributes. So uh, as we focus on resiliency, we also need to make sure that any resilient uh, or resiliency investments that we make ensure that our system is also safer, more reliable, more and hopefully more affordable than the alternative and certainly sustainable. So those are some of the uh, recommendations that we give. Uh, now back to our commissioner friends, and this is uh, our, my second to last slide. Back to our commissioner friends, uh, we looked to them to ask them, you know, what kind of principles do we need to do to make sure that we can implement resiliency? And the first thing that they mentioned was, well, uh, people want to know what they're paying for. We need to make sure that people understand uh, what a resilience investment is and that it is a forward-looking investment. It's not something that they're going to see today necessarily, but they will see it when they need it the most. And so it's important for us to provide that education to the public in conjunction with our regulators, well, right? We need I'm to talk to them to ensure that they understand that. Uh, we also need to focus on regulatory support. And obviously these come from outtakes from regulators. So that sounds a little bit odd, but the reality is that, as I mentioned before, regulators recognize that sometimes what they need is their support from other places like the legislature um, uh, to be able to implement this um, uh, in order for them to be able to create those frameworks that we need to enhance the reliability and resiliency. 
Um, and also uh, that regulatory support needs to come in the form of, let's talk about what our energy system uh, should look like, uh, not just uh, electric, not just gas, but them working in conjunction to offer us all, the, all that we need in terms of energy. Uh, and finally, in financial support, I think that's the more interesting piece, the piece that we really didn't look into as closely here, but what are some of the cost recovery mechanisms that allow us to ensure that those uh, resiliency investments are collected and are collected fairly uh, uh, from all of our customers without leaving anyone behind, right? Low-income customers should uh, be able to enjoy the benefits of a resilient, a resilient system without having to, you know, not be able to, to to provide for their families and things like that. So we really need to be very careful about how we create these cost recovery mechanisms, but it should be fair to everyone. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that uh, in case we have any questions. Uh, here are some of the conclusions. Uh, there are direct and indirect costs uh, uh, that uh, we need to recognize uh, that we look at through um, a concept of avoided cost. Uh, we need to enhance uh, operational coordination and, and uh, between gas and electric. Uh, we need to make sure that our regulators understand and are, uh, have the tools uh, necessary to address energy system resiliency, including the idea that natural gas is really critical to that, particularly because of its storage infrastructure through line pack and all things like that. And then um, we uh, need to look at those recommended resiliency investments and make sure that uh, we have everything that we need to be able to replace our aging infrastructure and uh, increase weatherization standards, all the things that I just mentioned. And then finally, we need to make sure that the public, our regulators, uh, those that uh, create the laws, uh, are understand the importance of, of all of this. So we, they can, we can offer, uh, or they can offer financial support so that we can take best care of our customers. And with that, I'm going to end my presentation then, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions if there are any. Great, thank you, Juan. Uh, go ahead and type your questions into the chat. And while you are all doing that, oh, wait, wait we have one right here. I have a question for you too, Juan, but I'll, I'll get to Gail's first. Uh, Gail asks, as far as natural gas adding resiliency to the electric side, have there been recent technological advances that allow gas to provide electricity at the residential or commercial level? Are there alternatives to backup generation such as advances in fuel cell technology? Yeah, so that's uh, a little bit outside the scope of what we were looking here. Um, but in the process of looking at these things, we certainly saw many utilities that have created uh, kind of uh, novel and new alternatives to what we're talking about here. Some utilities that, for example, have started to um, um, uh, issue uh, particularly in cold areas, some heat pumps, right? To sell heat pumps, electric heat pumps, um, that uh, then uh, kind of support uh, the, those heat pumps during the peak of peaks with their natural gas. And that, that in, in areas where, for example, they have seen a lot of, uh, they have a lot of hydro, that has been the case. And we certainly talked to some of uh, our friends in, for example, Montreal, who are doing things like that. So I don't know how much that answers your question. I'm not really in the technic technological side, but we have seen a lot of people start to look at, uh, for example, obviously gas heat pumps, things like that, to make sure that uh, during during some of these situations, we can provide the gas that is necessary. Dan, if you have a question yourself. Yeah, I was uh, I was just going off for the last 10 seconds, but uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for uh, for prompting me. I think where, where Gail was going with it is, uh, you know, are there opportunities for the gas industry uh, with regard to distributed energy resources? Uh, you know, basically think micro CHPs or fuel cell uh, type uh, home fuel cell type applications and the like. I think they're, you know, with regard to micro CHP, which is widely deployed in places like Japan where power prices are very high, uh, you know, that's that's an economic issue, but uh, the fuel cell piece is probably still 
still a little ways out there as we prove this technology in really scalable circumstances uh, before scaling it down. It's almost kind of the reverse uh, of, of what you find typically, right? So um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Juan. So, so my question has to do with, and you've got another nice comment uh, from Scott in the, in the chat about wonderful presentation, many great insights. So Thank you, Scott. Um, my question has to do with, did the study or did you gain any insights about the impact of reducing gas loads on overall energy system resiliency? So as we look at electrification or hybrid heat pumps that you referred to, um, you know, is there a sense of what that does to to overall uh, holistic energy system resiliency? So um, we didn't really look at what would happen if we were to, for example, electrify uh, or do a lot of electrification um, in, this, in this situation, right? In this particular report. Uh, but, um, you know, um, the, the reality is that the cost is a factor here, right? And with electrification, you start getting into a situation where less people would be having to pay for the same service. And oftentimes that makes it very, very expensive. And so, um, uh, again, we didn't get into that in this particular report, but I think if you tie this back to what happens to our, for example, our net zero report, right? Where we're saying, look, we need to make sure that this is affordable. So we need to make sure that people understand that we can't just start getting rid of our uh, of our pipeline because that would have dire consequences. Not only would it make it less resilient, but it will also make it more expensive. And so that's that's kind of where we where we landed thus far. Thank you. I do have another question here, and please others uh, feel free to type your questions into the chat. Uh, from Scott, uh, when I think of resiliency from a gas supply standpoint, I think of uh, more pipes. Uh, was much thought put into future pipes being hydrogen ready uh, as part of our energy transition. Seems like this would benefit resiliency and could be leveraged in some of the regulatory issues that were presented. Any thoughts on that, uh, Juan? Yeah, so this one I, we absolutely looked at, right? So if you look at here of our recommendations and you look at the upstream and downstream of the city gates, right? We really need to ac accommodate those low carbon fuels. Uh, hydrogen um, can be a great alternative and an, an additional source of energy for us that can be transmitted through our pipes and distributed through our pipes. And so we definitely uh, make the recommendation that we need to expand the integration of those alternative fuels into our uh, into our system, uh, and we do mention hydrogen as well as uh, locally produced LNG and RNG. So, um, so yeah, that's a recommendation that comes in here, and we think that's a critical one. Great. Okay. Any last questions uh, for Juan? Okay. Well, Juan, I want to thank you very much for bringing this uh, important study to us and. Um, I, I assume you'll be able to share your slide deck with me 